then you can just sing. Okay. Yeah, if you don't mind. Sing where? Right At the Laker. Here. Right here. That or way everybody live. can hear your voice. Good morning to everybody. Um, we're having a little bit of technical problems with our computer, but that's normal. Let's ask God's blessing. I have got a message for you today that I want you to pay close attention to because we may be seeing the great tribulation in this decade. It's very possible that we might be, and so I want you to pay close attention to what I'm going to be talking about today. Father, we thank you for each one who's here today who's watching online. We ask your blessing and your anointing on this service. In Jesus' name, and we believe we receive it. Amen. Amen. All right, without further ado, I'd like, we've got some music. This is original music, so for those of you who are watching us online and on YouTube who are trying to lock us up for using copyrighted music, this is our music that we wrote. So anyway, I'm going that to ask... That we have proprietary rights to. That we have proprietary rights to. All right, so... <laughs> And the young lady that, that uh, wrote the lyrics to this music, I'm going to ask her to come up right now, Miss Rachel Weber. She's going to sing it. And since we're having problems with the computer, I'm actually going to play it live. So if you hear some mistakes, you hear mistakes. Because it's him playing on the, on, when we sing every time, it's Dr. Slough playing on the recordings. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Hello. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. We're going to sing Personal Creator today. So if y'all would like to stand, we're going to worship God. I don't think we have any introduction. Do we? Yes, we do. We do? She did very well. 
I'm going to be talking about some today. First of all, this is part three of our uh, session on faith. Everybody needs to hear this because it's going to take faith to get through the times ahead. And that includes the tribulation that's coming right ahead of us. And we need to keep that in mind. Now, I will tell you this much, too. This is not very encouraging, but the Philadelphians that are promised protection during the tribulation are not promised protection from everything that happens before the tribulation. For example, let's say that the last days actually starts 50 years from now, which doesn't look like it, that's the case because they're ready to build the temple today. But let's say that's the case. Well, then everything that's happening now doesn't mean you're going to be protected because true Christians were not protected in Europe in World War I. Now, there may have been some that were, but I mean, there wasn't some blanket protection. World War II came. Christians weren't protected. And believe it or not, we could have a nuclear war that would not be the tribulation, and you and I may die in it. Keep that in mind. That's not a very encouraging thing to hear when you come to church. You don't want to come to church and hear that. But let's be honest and let's face the facts, because what I want to tell you is if you learn... Now, two weeks ago I gave part one, last week I gave part two, and today I'm going to finish up with part three of how to facilitate the faith of God. How to get it working in your life. And if you can learn this, even though maybe what's about to happen between Russia and America may not be the Great Tribulation, but it it it, it is still something you could survive. Yes, sir? The only people that don't want to hear it are the ones who don't want to hear the truth. Yeah. They don't. Carnal mind does not want to hear the truth. Listen to... Now, you know, I know that for, for those of you who have been attending for a number of years, you've heard me talk about things that are going to happen, and you'd sit there and yawn and say, yeah, 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 that's in the book of Revelation, but that may not be in our lifetime. I don't think I have to pay attention to this. Well, now it's not doctrine only. Now it's not just religion. Now it's not just church, and there she's yawning already, see. <coughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. But... But listen to what is being said on the news. Now, one Democrat lady, I bring out the fact that she is a Democrat. She is criticizing her own party. This is, she's a former Congresswoman. She's in the U.S. Army Reserves, a Lieutenant Colonel, and she's a, she was a 2020 presidential candidate. Tulsi Gabbard is her name. She said this, and it took me a, a good 45 minutes to transcribe all this. Listen to what she said, quote, now remember, you got to remember, she's not a Republican condemning uh, Biden in a partisan way. She is a Democrat. Keep that in mind. She said, quote, the Biden administration's policies, words, and actions is just being made very clear to us. By the way, this is not a political speech. I'm not being partisan here this morning. I'm wanting you to know what is being said, not by preachers, but by people who are in government. That's what I want you to pay attention to because we may be in the last days. Listen carefully. She said their uh, policies and words and actions, it's just been made very clear to us what their real goal is, and their real goal is the destruction of the Russian state. Now then she added the Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said as much. I didn't hear him say that, but I heard what Lindsey Graham said, said. How many of you heard Lindsey Graham in an interview say, we need to take out Putin. Mm -hmm. yeah. Those are fighting words. If Russia said, let's take out Washington, D.C., let's take out the, the government of Washington, D.C., let's get rid of the President of the United States, yeah. those would be fighting words. And Putin has heard that. You know, when I was in grade school, I remember, I might have been in the sixth, seventh grade, I don't remember, but I read a book on the OSS. And they said in that book that Russia at that time had more spies in the United States than you could fill up Yankee Stadium. Probably got a lot more today. So they watch the news. Don't you think they report back to Putin and say, guess what they're saying? They're going to take you out. What is happening? And at the bottom of the screen was this headline. I'll tell you what's happening. Listening to this banner. Our leaders are knowingly provoking Russia, quote, unquote. Knowingly doing it. Why? Why would they want to do that? It doesn't make any sense. Well, anyway, she added, quote, Russia has almost, has also made it very clear that if we even get close to, and this is how she said it, quote, unquote, winning and achieving this mission and goal, if we even get close to taking him out, he's going to defend himself. 
America is, is provoking a war, and this is what he has said, according to this Democrat now. She was in Congress. Russia said very clearly they will have no other option but to resort to the use of nuclear weapons, starting first with tactical nuclear weapons, and if necessary, escalating to the use of strategic nuclear weapons. And then she added, this is not fear-mongering. To point this out, the American people need to know that this is the track that this administration has put us on. And the very dire consequence that will occur if we continue down this path to our families, the dire consequence to our families, yours, our communities, our country, and frankly, the world. This is the reality that we are facing. So it's not some preacher saying, oh, we're at the end of the world. And, you know, yeah, right, right, yeah. No, this is what is being said right now today. This is the most dangerous time I've ever lived in my entire life. In fact, this is the most dangerous time for Americans since 1962 at the Cuban Missile Crisis when they evacuated Washington. Maybe some of you didn't know that. But they evacuated Washington, told you know that, to go underground because the Russians will very likely bomb Washington. Now, we live here in North Carolina. Some of you are watching other places in the United States, but we live here seven hours from Washington, D.C. If, uh, if the winds were blowing from the north, and especially if they were to bomb Washington in wintertime, and the wind is blowing from the north like it does in wintertime, the fallout would come down here and all of you folks would die. Horrible thing to come to church and hear, but folks, you need to hear the truth. Like you said, Billy, people don't want to hear the truth. This is the truth. And even no matter which way the winds are blowing. By the way, Jesus said the wind bloweth where it listeth, meaning where it will. One day it's blowing north, one day, next day it's blowing south. There's no guarantee. But think about all the friends and relatives that you have in other parts of the United States who could die from this. And think about your own families, brothers and sisters who live right around you that could die. And the people that don't die immediately because they're not at ground zero would die from cancer getting from the radiation that would be caused. I don't mean to scare you, but let me just read you a little bit more. And then we're going to get into the solution, which is the faith of God. And we're going to finish this series today. By the way, at the bottom of the screen, here's another banner they put on there while Gabbard was talking. Quote, lunatics in D.C. don't seem to care that Putin is actively preparing for nuclear war. End quote. Then the third banner they had was this, at the banner at the bottom of the screen, Tulsi Gabbard, colon, the path the Biden administration has us on will lead to nuclear Armageddon. Now, Armageddon is a biblical term, but politicians and statesmen today use the term Armageddon to refer to cosmocide, human annihilation. That's what they're using it for. In fact, that started at least as early as 1945 when Douglas MacArthur, MacArthur, Douglas MacArthur, if I can say his name, thank you. Douglas MacArthur, who was standing on the USS Missouri, and they were signing the surrender papers, Japan was, he said, if we don't find some uh, better way to handle things, we're, we're facing our nuclear Armageddon. It's an Armageddon that's coming, meaning everybody's going to die. Now, well, I'm going to quote you a scripture about that a little bit too. Let me read just a little bit more. We're going to get right into the Bible. Gabbard added these words, there's no explanation for their actions, their decisions, and their policies because it directly threatens the lives and the well-being of the American people. They're not just going to attack the, the people in Congress. They're coming after you and me, the people who voted these rascals in. But not only the American people, she said, but frankly, the world, if we continue down this path. I think on a hopeful note, it's not too late. Well, that's good to hear. She gave us a hopeful note. That by God's grace, we the people can stop this before it's too late. How? By taking action, throwing out the warmongers that are in Congress, and actually voting for and electing leaders in this country who will take action to end this insanity before, frankly, she said, the world is destroyed. Cosmicide. You've heard the expression, throw the bums out? last couple of years, that's what the Republicans have been saying. Throw the bums out. She is a Democrat. She's saying we need to get these people out. I like drain the swamp. Though. Drain the swamp? <laughs> Same thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, before you vote, first of all, 
decide if the person is a Democrat or Republican. If he's a Democrat, you know he's a liberal already. If he's a Republican, then decide is he conservative or a rhino. If he's a rhino, don't vote for him. Conservative politicians are those who say, let's use some common sense. Come on now, let's use some common sense. The Democrats, they just tried to pass a law to make it federal law so that the Supreme Court couldn't change Roe versus Wade, that you can kill babies all the way up to the ninth month. On the day of delivery, kill the baby. That's infanticide. Anybody who doesn't think that's murder is just lying to himself. We know that's murder. All right, let me read you a scripture, what Jesus said. This scripture was fulfilled in the year 1955, according to the Britannica, the Encyclopedia Britannica. In the Olivet Prophecy, Jesus made this statement. He said, then shall be great tribulation. That wasn't fulfilled, but listen to what I'm getting ready to say here. There will come great tribulation. That's still in our future, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened. Those days, at the time of the end, there should no flesh be saved. That was never possible. Any war that we've ever had in history, not you, you never had a war where everybody could die. But once we had enough weapons between East and West, nuclear weapons, by the year 1955, they said, we've got enough weapons now to wipe out every man, woman, child on planet Earth. So this prophecy was fulfilled in 1955. We now have the capability of committing cosmocide. And now North Korea, run by a complete idiot, maybe I shouldn't say that on YouTube, it might take me off, but a guy who's crazy, and the people in Iran, Iran may have the nuclear weapons, we don't know. Trump tried to put a stop to that, but I want to get into all, all that, but a fact to say that, folks, we're in a dangerous, very dangerous situation. And we need not to be living like lukewarm Christians, like Laodicean Christians. We need to get serious about our relationship with Jesus Christ. Get serious about being in church. Get serious about, about being a part of God's end time work to reach many, many thousands of people. We need to be reaching millions. One of our graduates told me years ago, he said, man, with all this truth you got, you ought to be reaching millions of people. And I said, yeah. And he was quite financially well off, but he didn't, didn't support our ministry. But he said, but you ought to. I had one lady one time, she came, I don't forget where she lived, but she came here to the Charlotte area, and, and I'd known her for many, many years. And she said, why aren't you on this station and this station? Well, here's some good Christian stations. You reach a lot of people. And she mentioned all these Christian stations in Charlotte. How come you're not on these stations? Yeah, it's not like I don't want to be on those stations. I looked at her and I said, well, we will be when people like you support us so we can be. And she never said another word. That was the end of that. And she never gave us a penny to our ministry. I had made a policy when I was we ordained. We have a, a, a generous benefactor sponsoring one of our radio programs. Yes, one of our radio stations by a generous benefactor who wishes to be re remain anonymous unless he wants me to mention his name. And I'll be very happy to. But otherwise, otherwise... All of us need to be supporting that radio ministry, but I made a policy when I was ordained at age 30 that I would never pass a plate, and I have done so in all these years. I, lay it, I asked God to lay it on people's hearts to support our ministry because if we're at the time of the end, if we are in the last decade, what's more important? What is, what is the most important thing we could do? Not buy money, stocks from the stock market. But you're not buying money. Well, you might be buying money, Bitcoin and all this other stuff. Oh, by the way, I just saw in the news yesterday you saw it too, I guess. I sh they showed an x-ray of somebody's right hand. In England now, they've perfected a little thing that weighs a gram, whatever a gram is, and it's uh, the size of a grain of rice. They've actually done this now. They've actually inserted it into a person's right hand. And when you go to the grocery store, you run your hand over the scanner, and it just debits your bank account. I've been talking about that for years. That, they're now making this available for thousands and thousands of people in England to use this technology. That's coming to the United States. You say, what's wrong with that? Nothing. But what would happen if the Antichrist comes along and says, now look, I'm gonna let you get into the system, but you gotta, you gotta be a part of our administration. You gotta, be, you gotta support our administration or I won't let you do this. What are you gonna do? 
there's a, we don't know how it's all going to work out, but God said when they offer you a mark in your right hand in order to buy, like groceries, don't take it. Read Revelation 14. Look at what happens to those who take that mark. A mark is an identifying sign. Having a credit card in your wallet is not the mark of the beast. But when they say, oh, we're going to put it in your hand. Well, what if you don't have a hand? Well, we got a forehead. All they got to do is scan your forehead, scan your hand. Then you can buy your groceries. Won't that be wonderful? Well, Sounds great. And people are going to be deceived started, into taking it. Well, you know they already started that step at the hospital where they want to scan your palm and you pull up your medical records. Yeah, you go in there, do you do, do you do the palm scan? It reminds me of when I used to go to the grocery store. Do you want paper or plastic? Now they don't ask you. So they've been asking me for years, do you do the palm scan? I say no. <coughs> now they don't ask. I don't. The day's going to come when they won't ask. I'll just say, here, do this. Do you want to be treated or don't you? Well, yeah. Well, use palm scan. So it's, it's going to get to that. Here's what Jesus said. Except those days, in the last days, those days of tribulation should be shortened. No flesh should be saved. Now, it doesn't say souls. It says flesh. No flesh would be saved. That includes dogs and cats. But I do have some good news for you. Now they're saying, well, roaches might survive a nuclear war. But they'd be the only things. Isn't that wonderful? See? So it's not all bad. Roaches might survive. Yeah. Maybe the roaches will start evolving and eventually start the human race all over again. Who knows? But no, Jesus said all flesh would die, so I think the riches will die too. Here's what he said, but for the elect's sake, and the elect is not referring to Israel. According to Romans 11, 7, it says, Israel has not obtained it, but the elect has. That's you. You are the elect. For your sake, those days shall be shortened. God's not going to allow the human race to be destroyed. And then, then means at that time, if anybody says, lo, here is Christ or there, don't believe it, because there's going to be false Christ that's going to show up. Sun, Myon, Moon, came over here from Korea and he said, I am the Messiah. Jesus said, if they say he's here or there, well, don't you believe it? He said, because he's coming back in the clouds of heaven. Somebody asked some young moon, well, why did, if you're the Messiah, why didn't you come back in the clouds of heaven? He said, I did. I came back in a uh, 747 from Korea. Came back in the clouds. Good grief. That's not what it means. You say, well, Keith, how do you know? Because it says, every eye will see him. And I didn't see him. My parents didn't see him. And neither did my grandparents. So I don't care what kind of an airplane it came over on. All right, now I'm going to finish up part three. And if you have any questions, interrupt me, stop me. And if I'm not asking your questions in a timely manner, it's because my computer is still down and I'm trying to get it up so that I can see their questions. So don't fuss at me, guy. <laughs> yeah, because the computer is not working like it should. Oh, two more quick quotations. This came from... Tucker Carlson, I don't know what you think about him, but here's what he said. We are moving at high speed toward open war with Russia. We are funding Ukrainian government to the tune of tens of billions of dollars a year. The Russians are saying, watch out, we could launch nuclear weapons. This is happening like we're sleepwalking, he said. His opinion. But I think it's worthy of notice. He said one more thing. We are approaching a nuclear conflict. This is not religion. I'm not preaching religion to you. I'm talking about what's happening in, in our world today. And so, so many people say, oh, Keith, that's just your opinion. Look, at, look, this is what other people are saying. I've been saying for years they're going to rebuild the temple. And I've had people to argue with me. Oh, they'll never rebuild that temple. I mean, years ago, people were arguing, oh, they'll never rebuild that temple. I went to a prophecy seminar down here on Highway 49 some years ago. And the guy that was teaching the seminar, somebody asked him, do you think they're going to rebuild the temple? No, they're not going to rebuild it. He was, he was a preacher saying that. They're not going to rebuild it. Well, now they're ready to rebuild. We're getting very, very close. He said, one more thing. We are approaching a nuclear conflict. Russia is signaling that louder every day. If they are saying... Uh, if they are saying they might use nuclear weapons, maybe we should listen, question mark. All right, what can you and I do about it? You didn't come to church to, to, to be told all these sad things, but if you turn on the TV and you watch the news, you're going to get the same junk. I want to give you something encouraging. When you leave here today, I want you to be encouraged. Now, last week, let me segue from what I talked about last week 
to, uh, to today. Last week I talked to you about how that we can decree things. When, when these horrible times come, and, and this may not be the tribulation. If we do have a war with Russia, that may not be the great tribulation. So do you have any promise of protection to get through those times? Well, you may. Because, you see, the Bible says, Thou shalt decree a thing, and it will be established. Do you need food? Right now, 26 states don't have baby formula for their babies. I just found out today on the news where it's going. Crates are being sent to the border to give it to illegals, people who are not even citizens, while our own American people are suffering in 26 states. The, the ladies don't have baby formula. Well, they can get it two or three years. But, but one mother that was interviewed on television said that a baby's brain is uh, formed during the first year of its life, primarily. And you need that baby formula right away. You can't wait two or three years. you got to have it now. And not all women can breastfeed. Yeah, and that was another thing. Um, what was her name? That famous Brett, Bette Midler, who's in her mid-70s, said, oh, well, just let her breastfeed. But like you said, not all women can. Women who have other problems, health problems, sometimes are told by their doctors don't. All right. So you can decree a thing and it'll be established to you. You can, first of all, James says you have not because you ask not. When these bad things occur, we should ask God, Father, I need food for my kids, for your family. I need bread. I, what did Jesus say? Pray, give us our daily bread. Pray that. James says you have not because you ask not. So ask. Pray and ask God to provide for your needs. Philippians 4.19. If you are doing what the Philippians did, you'll, you'll get the promise that the Philippians got, which was to have your needs met. And then I mentioned uh, Romans 4.17 last time. God calls things that be not as though they are. You decree it. God's meeting my needs. And you look around and you don't have any groceries in the house. But you pray and you believe and you say, God is meeting my needs. And you start decreeing it before you see it happen. And then last time I gave you an illustration of those ten lepers. And I'm segueing into what I want to talk about today. The ten lepers, all ten were healed. Jesus said they were. But he never saw the other nine. How did he know they were healed? Because of Mark eleven twenty three, He says, if you say something, if you decree it, you believe that what you say will come to pass. You'll have what you say. Now that is the way you please God. You know, when Jesus said, have the faith of God, do you know that's not optional? That's a commandment. John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's not optional. Have the faith of God. Yes, sir. How do you just have it? Well, I talked about last time about planting the faith you do have like a seed and it'll begin to grow. How many of you uh, have already been cursing some fig trees this week, by the way? Okay, good, good. All right. Or doing something else to a fig tree. I told ours to produce more figs. <laughs> or some other kind of tree. Uh, how many of you have been practicing your faith? Anybody? Practice your faith. The way you learn the piano, and I still make mistakes, but I play it as well as I do because I practice and practice and practice and practice. And, and you will begin to develop your skills as you practice. It's like riding a bicycle the first time you get on when you fall off. But you keep practicing. And so when you start using your faith, it may be a grain of mustard seed, but you keep sowing it into your heart through the Word of God. You'll start to grow. All right, now, here's a scripture I did not read last time, but I need to. Well, I'll say that till later. I want to probably give that toward the end of my message. But we have to understand that nothing is too hard for God. If the Russians should attack us, would you be protected? Maybe. If you're living by faith, you're going to find out this isn't church, this isn't religion, this isn't just religious teaching. This is reality. When you need food on your table, that's not religion, that's reality. Genesis 18, 14, God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? If you speak out of the abundance of your heart, the Bible says, you'll have whatever you say. Now, I want to go to Luke 6, 45. We're going to get into today's message. Stop me if you have a question. But one caveat. If all you do is hear this and say, oh, that was interesting, and you don't do a thing about it, it won't benefit you. I can read all day 
a book on how to fly an airplane, but if I never get in the airplane, I'll never fly it. I may know how to fly one, but until I get in it, it's not going to fly. What does it mean to speak out of the abundance of your heart? That's a very good question. What does it mean to speak out of the abundance of your heart? Let's read what he said, and then I want to answer that. In Luke 6, 45, a good man out of the good treasure, that's the abundance. You know, if I bring out a penny here, you'll say, I don't want that penny. But if I bring out a $10,000 bill, that's a treasure. That's abundance. So treasure is abundance. A good man out of the good treasure, the abundance of his heart, brings forth. <coughs> he brings forth good things. But also it works for an evil man. Jesus said, whosoever says to the mountain, good or bad, an evil man out of the evil treasure, out of the abundance of his heart, brings forth. Why? For out of the abundance of the heart is the good man or the evil man. His mouth speaks. The abundance of your heart is what is really in your heart. If all you do is watch the news all the time, it's going to be bad things. And if all you do is watch violence on television, what you watch or eat becomes a part of you. If you feed on the Word of God and learn to build up your faith, that's going to be abundant in your heart. And so therefore, when you speak out of your heart, it's going to come to pass. If Let me give you an illustration. Let's give you a negative illustration. The doctor says you've got six months to live. And you get on the internet and you study everything you can about that disease. And the more you read, the more you're convinced, yep, there's no cure. I will die in six months. That becomes more and more abundant in your heart. And guess what happens? You start speaking, I'm dying in six months. I've known people to die on the very day when the doctor predicted it. The doctor would say, you have 90 days to live. And on the 90th day, the guy would die. Because he's repeating what the doctor said. It comes out of his heart. Now, what if you feed on the word of God? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Ah, uh, Slough, you're bragging. Am I? I said through Christ. I can decree it and it'll come to pass. Do you know I can move a mountain? Now you really think I'm bragging. But wait a minute, isn't that what Jesus said? So what's abundantly in your heart is what you put in your heart. The daily news or the word of God. And you feed on this book and you feed on this book. I'm not talking about memorizing scriptures. If you're a brand new Christian, that might be a good thing to do is memorize some. But read it and read it and read it until it sticks in you, until it becomes a part of you, and then just flows out of you. When it comes out of your heart, that's when you have what you say. Now, to answer that question a little bit further, I could tell you what to say, and you could repeat after me and say it, but that's not in your heart. What I read off this page didn't come out of my heart. It came off the page. I could read anything off this page. But when it gets in here and you begin to speak out of what is really in your heart, that's when it comes to pass. If I walk up to a person who's got some terminal illness and I say, be healed. And I'm saying that out of my head because I read it in the Bible. That's not the same thing. Here's what people will do. Yes, I believe. I believe they're going to be healed. Yeah, the Bible says so. The Bible says. The Bible says. The Bible says. Yeah, that's it. Boy, you're a Bible believer. I sure am. And then you sit down and say, I'm afraid he's going to die. That comes out of your heart. That's what you really believe. You can stand here and say, I believe this, I believe that. And then when you sit down and you're no longer in church, yeah, he's going to die. That comes out of your heart. What you speak out of your heart, what you really believe, he said you'll have it. That's why most Christians don't move mountains. They don't really believe it's going to happen to start with. Any questions? Yes, sir. Just a comment. Um, a lot of times when you you step out in faith, especially if you're just starting to do that sort of thing, um, you're going to get some resistance uh, from the adversary. He's going to stick things in your head. That's not really going to work. You're you just watch, da da da, this and that. You don't really believe me. Is God really going to do that for you? Everything that that can possibly be like a monkey wrench thrown into your faith is going to happen. And you have to say, I'm not afraid of that. I've not been given a spirit of fear, but a spirit of faith and a yep. love and a sound mind. I'm not going to succumb to that. You have that, to resist. That's what Jesus did. The devil said one thing, and Jesus said, but it's written. Mm -hmm. but it's written 
And that's exactly how Jesus handled the adversary. Not every thought that comes into your head is yours. Yeah. Amen. The devil can put thoughts in your mind. Uh, oh, years ago, this lady was arrested for running over people on the sidewalk and said, why would you do that? You didn't know those people. She said, no. Well, what made you do it? She said, I was just driving down the road and a voice spoke to me and said, run over those people on the sidewalk. So see, she said, I just turned the car and ran over all those people and killed them because a voice told me to. Be careful what you hear. Be careful the voices you hear. Jesus said, beware of false prophets. And it says in 1 John 4, 1, don't believe every spirit just because the spirit talks to you. All right, so if you speak out of the abundance of your heart, you will have what you say. Well, the abundance of your heart means you've got the faith of God. Again, we're talking about how to make the faith of God easier for you to have. Now, I want to go to Ephesians 3.20. We're going to zero in on this thing today. And by the time you leave here today in about 25 minutes, you are going to understand in the next 25 minutes really how easy it is to have and to use the faith of God. Chapter 3. Paul ends this chapter by saying with this benediction, Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think. Now God is able to do above what you ask or think. But he added this, according to the power that works in us. For several years I wondered what the power was. Could the power be the Holy Spirit? Well, maybe. Could the power be the Word? You know, what is the power? Jesus said, if you tell a mountain to move and you believe it using the faith of God, Mark 11, 22 and 23, then it will move the mountain. To move a mountain requires a lot of dynamite, a lot of TNT. What is, what is dynamite? The Greek word dynamite comes from the word dunamis. It's an English word, but it comes from a Greek word, which means power. Dynamite means I is the rock. The rock of power is what dynamite means. Power rock. It takes a lot of power to move a mountain. You'd have to use dynamite. You couldn't use a shovel. Jesus said, but if you use the faith of God, you can move it. So what does that tell you? The faith of God is tremendous power that is greater than dynamite. That's the power he's talking about. So let's read it again. Now unto God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above whatever you ask or even think. But it's according to the faith of God that works in you. James says faith without works is dead. If the faith, if that power that God has given you is not working, you might as well not have it. You could have a beautiful car sitting in your carport and you never drive it. You walk everywhere you go. Well, it's nice having that car, but it doesn't do you any good because you're not using it. You've got all that power that you're not using. It's according to the power that's working. The faith of God is the power, and that's what has to work in your life. Now remember, and I won't turn there, Matthew 12, 34, Jesus said you're going to be held accountable for your idle words. The word idle does not mean individual. Idle in the Greek means inoperative or inactive. It's like you let your engine on your car idle. You're just sitting at a stoplight, just going, blah, blah, blah. you're not going anywhere. You're just sitting there, engine's idling. If your words are not producing, God's going to hold you accountable for that. Yes, sir, do you have a question? Like the person talking all the time and not ever saying anything. <laughs> yeah, idle words. Yeah. But what is he really saying? Jesus, what is he really saying? You'll be held accountable if you speak words that don't produce, words that are inactive. Let me go back, and I'm not going to turn to the scripture for time's sake, but remember the story of where Israel needed water, and God said, go take your rod and smite the rock and you'll get water. When they came to the Red Sea, God said, raise your rod. Now, let me tell you what that rod was. It was a stick. You can't part the Red Sea with a stick. You can't get water out of a rock with a dumb stick. But that, rep that stick represented a rod of authority. Do we have a question? Yeah. I'll take it in just a moment. And, the, and a, a king carried a rod with him. They called it a scepter. So Moses would hold up that stick, which represented a rod of authority. And all of Israel would say, ooh, he's holding up the rod. And miracles would happen. The hail came down. All these things would happen. All he had to do was hold up that rod. When they needed water, he used that rod against the rock. And that rod, that stick, was his authority. Now, hold on to that. We'll take this question. 
It's a statement, but I would like to pose it as a question. Okay. Our friend guy in Canada, he is saying a spirit could also mean philosophies and doctrines. True. Yeah, philo a spirit could refer to like the spirit of the ages, philosophies, doctrines, the culture around it. Yeah, that's true too. Yeah, that is true. You don't have a rod. Nobody here brought a rod today with you. Guess what? None of you in here have any authority because you didn't bring a rod with you. I imagine we could go find one out in the woods behind the building. I'm scared. Oh, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all stand right there. All right. Oh, God. Here's, what, happened. Remember, remember in what happened. Remember in Revelation 19. When Christ returns, he's got a sword going out of his mouth symbolically. It's a two-edged sword, Hebrew sword. It says it's a two-edged sword. What does the sword represent? What is it a symbol of? The word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Ephesians 6 says the, the word of God is the sword. So Jesus, what comes out of your mouth besides breath? Words. Words. So Jesus is going to smite them with the rod of his mouth. All right, now. Words are more powerful than a stick. God told Moses, Hey, buddy, come here. Take your rod and lay it over there. You don't need it anymore. I'm going to elevate you. I'm going to give you greater authority than with that rod. From now on, Moses, forget the rod. Now you're just going to speak, and it'll come to pass. Power of life and death. Yeah. The power of life and death is in the tongue. So God was teaching Moses this. He said, Now you need water again. Forget the rod. Go lay it down. Now you go over there and you speak to the rock. Your words will, from now on, your words will have authority. Your words will have power. Moses really messed up an opportunity to teach us something. And he went over there and hit the rock again. And that so angered God, he said, you're not going into the promised land. That's a little tiny, itty bitty mistake. But he kept him out of the promised land. And he said, not because you hit the rock, he said, because you didn't sanctify me. How would Moses have sanctified God? By obeying God, for one thing, and learning to do what Jesus did. Jesus didn't have a rod when he made the, the waves cease and the wind cease. They said, Master, we're about to perish, save us. You know, they were in the boat. You know the story. Jesus got up and he spoke to the wind and the waves, and they ceased. When he... When he healed people, he spoke the word. Do you notice in all four Gospels, Jesus never carried a rod with him? He had something more powerful, words. Now, the reason I bring that up is because God has told you, 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 all of us, everybody you watching online are going to be held accountable if your words aren't working for you. They're idle words. Yeah, Aaron had a rod that, that even budded once. They had rods representing their authority. But God elevated it. Your words are more powerful than a physical stick. In other words, Jesus thankfully did what Moses failed to do. Jesus said, come here, let me show you something. Fig tree, no, no man's going to ever eat fruit on you hereafter, forever, after. So he spoke the word, and immediately the fig tree died. He said, not only can you do this, Matthew 21, 21 says, if you have the faith of God and you don't doubt, You'll not, you will not only do what I did to the fig tree, but you can tell them out and move. He says your words have authority, but if you're speaking idle words that don't mean anything, God's going to hold you accountable. Meaning, not just apostles, not just prophets, but you, individual Christians, must use our words with authority. Meaning, walk up to that cancer and tell it to die. I've done it. I've commanded the cancer, in one case, a man had leukemia, and I had to study it. I didn't know much about it. And uh, there's uh, something called a blast that was eating away his white blood corpuscles. He had three months to live. I cursed it. After I found out how to get him healed, I said, die in Jesus' name. I command you to die. It died, and three months later, he was doing fine. They let him out, out of the hospital. And uh, two years later, I went back to see him. He's still alive. God will do that for you. You don't have to be an Oral Roberts. You just have to be a believer in Jesus. John 14, 12, he that believes on me, that's Joe Schmo, that's John Doe, that's Mary Smith, that's anybody. He that believes on me, the works that I do, he'll do. 
All right, now, Numbers 23, 19, for time's sake, I won't turn to it, but here's what it says. You, I'm giving you these scriptures. You can write them down, look them up later, and make a good Bible study. Jesus put, the Bible says God put a word in the prophet's mouth. This comes directly from God. Has he said and shall he not do it? Wow. Has he spoken and shall he not make it good? When you give a promise, you make it good. I'm going to make good on my promise. If God promised it, he's going to do it. Now, you may want to go with me to 2 Corinthians. I'll tell you, in my opinion, for those of you who are, who are preachers and are watching, those of you who are ministers, you may agree with me on this. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 is one of the most awkwardly written chapters in the entire Bible. In fact, if all you do is read 2 Corinthians chapter 1, you probably will say, I don't understand what the heck he's talking about. It's a hard chapter to read. However, however, in fact, all of 2 Corinthians is a little bit hard. That's not the place to start reading your Bible if you've never read the Bible. Don't start with 2 Corinthians. Start with the Gospel of John. That's easy. But <clears throat> let me read to you some parts that are fairly plain. Let's take a look at it. 2 Corinthians 1 starting in verse 15, and in this confidence I was minded to come to you before that you might have a second benefit and to pass by you into Macedonia and to come again out of Macedonia, that's in northern Greece, Corinth was in southern Greece, that I might come again out of Macedonia to you, traveling south, and of you or by you, the Greek says, to be brought on my way. In other words, he needed their financial help to do all this traveling, so he was saying, you will bring me on my way. In other words, you're going to sponsor this trip. When I therefore was thus minded, did I use likeness? Were the things that I purpose, in modern English, the, the things that I propose, do I propose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? Huh? What's he talking about? Now, in Old English, yea means yes, nay means no. That with me there should be yes, yes, and no, no? Now, we don't talk that way today. What in the world is he saying? But as God is true, our word towards you was not yes and no. What in the world is Paul saying here? But as God is true, our word, like God, is not yes and no. God's word is not yes and no. Huh? All right, let me tell you what he's talking about here. God, the, Bible, the Bible teaches itself. The Bible explains itself. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. Let's put that in modern English. But the Son of God is not yes and no, but in him is yes. Again, what is he referring to? Keep reading. Verse 20, for all the promises of God in him that comes to us through Jesus, in him, all the promises of God in him are yea and in him, amen. Why? To glorify God. To the glory of God by us or through us, the Greek says. All right. Let's make this real plain. The promises of God all of you have heard this said, well, God answers every prayer, but sometimes he says no. You've heard that. Yes, I have. God answers every prayer, but sometimes he says no. Wait, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. I might ask for a pink Cadillac and maybe God will say no, because that's not a promise. I can't find that. But what if I find a promise that, that if I to repent of my sins and accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior, is he going to say, no, I don't like you, Slow. No. Uh-uh. The promise is whosoever believes on him, I'm whosoever. God, you promised, I know I'm a Gentile, and I know I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm not a great and important person, but you promised that whosoever. Lord, will you keep your promise to save me? What's he going to say? Yes. yes. Lord, will you forgive me for what I've done? Yes. You promised to forgive me? Lord, you've promised to heal. Psalm 103, verse 3. Will you heal me? Yes. The promises are all yes. Maybe not everything you want. But the promises of God are yes. What does amen mean? Remember when Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, look it up in Greek. The word is amen, amen. Amen means truly. All right, read it that way. For all the promises of God in Jesus are yes and in him truly. 
to the glory of God. It will glorify God. Isn't that amazing? I read after a preacher many years ago, his son came to him and said, Dad, you, will you take us, I think it's to the park. And he said, no, I'm reading right now. I can't do it. And the kid said, but Dad, you promised. And he thought for a moment. He said, that's right, I did promise. He laid his book down and said, let's go. He said, I could not break a promise to my own son. How much less would God break a promise to his children? God won't break a promise. What you do is you find the promises in, in here. And all the promises in him are yes and amen. So what is it that you need? Well, if Russia should attack us, or maybe China, maybe both of them will, we're going to need to walk in the supernatural protection of Almighty God. And brother, I'm telling you, this is not religion. This is living out here on the street. This is living in your home. This is reality. This is eating seven days a week. This is having water to drink. We're talking reality here, not religion. A lot of religion is just philosophy. We're talking reality. You live to walk by the faith of God, and you can be protected when these times come. Okay, I'll take it. Anita wanted to know what was the scripture reference in Matthew? Matthew 12, 34 is what I wrote down from memory. I hope that's correct. Now, in Romans 4, it says, verse 17, God said to Abraham, I have made you, that's past tense, a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickens the dead, makes alive the dead, and calls those things that be not as though they were. Moses wasn't anybody's father. He had no children at that time. Not even Ishmael was born. God looked at Abraham and said, I've made you the father of many nations. He said that before Abraham even had a son. But in God's mind, it's a done deal. I have saved you. I have given you eternal life. Yeah, but Lord, the doctor told me, I don't care what the doctor says, I've given you eternal life. You're going to live forever. 10,000 years from now, you're going to be with me in, God, in my kingdom. Who are you going to believe? Let's believe God. I have eternal life. Jesus said, he that believes on me shall never see death. Now the body will lay down, yeah, but you will never see death. Abraham, against hope. You ever had a situation where you're between a rock and a hard place? Against hope, believed in hope. Why? That he may become according to that which was spoken. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body. Don't look at the x-rays. Don't look at your own body. Consider God's word to heal or whatever the situation may be. He staggered, verse 20, not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong. In faith. How do you get to be strong in faith? Giving glory to God. Thank you, God. All my needs are met. What have you just done? You just made a decree. And what you decree will be established. Job 22, verse 28. Thou shalt make a decree, and it shall be established unto you. You decree it. Thank God. I prayed last night for my needs to be met. Thank God my needs are met. I don't see any bread, and I'm kind of hungry. But Lord, thank you that all my needs are met. When something bad happens to you, don't cuss. Say, thank God all things work together for my good. All things work together for my good. We won't see it if we don't believe it. Yeah. The carnal mind says seeing is believing. God said you believe and you'll see. Believe his word. Because then you please God. Abraham, verse 20, did not stagger at God's promise. But he was strong in faith, giving glory to God before he ever had Isaac. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. If you say, Keith, would you come and tutor my child? They need some help in math. Yeah, if it's first grade, I can help them pretty well. Now, don't ask me to teach them calculus. I am able to perform basic math. I can come and tutor your child. Sure. I, I'm able to do it. If I promise you I'm going to do it, that means I can do it. Now, if you ask me, would you come and work on my car? I can't make you a promise. I can do little things like change the oil in the car, but you know the way they make these cars now, nowadays, the way they make these engines, I can't make you any promises. I can teach you how to ride a bicycle. I can teach you how to drive a car. The things that I'm able to do is what I'm promising. If God made you a promise, he's able to do it. If I make you a promise, I'm coming to your house today and I'm going to clean your house, that means I'm able to do it, right? 
I'm not going to promise something that I know I can't do. I could teach you the basics of the keyboard. I can teach you, you know, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. There's seven basic notes. I can teach you the basics. But don't ask me to teach you how to read music because I play by ear. I can teach you what I know. So anything I promise is based on what I know it can perform. If God promised you salvation, he can do it. If he promised you eternal life, he can do it. And if he promised to supply your needs, no matter what Russia and America gets into, no matter what China does to America, no matter what you hear on the news, and all of us watch the news, and we we're, we're seeing all these things happening, and it puts fear in us. But I love God, and perfect love is out fear. I love God. God's going to take care of me. God's going to take care of me. And you say, well, Keith, and then we'll just hang around you and we'll be all right. No, you got to live by faith. Don't ever trust a man. You trust God. Yeah, but Keith, we know that you're going to make it. You don't know anything. You better make sure you're going to make it. You start living by faith. And if every one of us in this room will live by faith, we can all make it together. But I've got to do my part and you have to do your part. Don't ever join a church or don't ever attach yourself to any man, prophet, apostle, whoever, thinking he's going to save you. He's not. You're going to have to do it on your own. All right. Now, he was fully persuaded that what God had promised he was able to perform. And I believe that God is going to perform it. I believe he will. Now, I want to conclude with... Um, let me give you one other scripture. In John 6, 37, Jesus said, He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Mm -hmm. If you come to him, Lord, you promised to give me my daily bread and I'm hungry. You don't come to him and say, get out of here. Uh-uh. He promised. All of his promises are yes and amen. He won't cast you out. You come walking in the door. When you Remember what it says in the book of Hebrews, we come before the throne of God. Remember in Hebrews I think it's 11, it says, you, we come before the, the new Jerusalem when we pray. We come before God. We come even before all the heavenly angels. When you go to your prayer closet and you kneel down before God, you're coming before God. Lord, I don't have any groceries and I can't afford it. Or some of you in other states and they don't have baby formula. And maybe some of you know it, need it or your daughter or granddaughter needs it or whatever. You come before God and say, God, I don't have what I need. And you promise to supply my needs. I'm doing my part. I'm asking you now to do what you said you'd do. And you ask for your daily bread. And then you believe that God will su supply that need. Mark 11, 24, whatever you're desiring. When you pray, you believe you receive it. If I believe I receive it, I decree it. And you come before God. God is not going to say, get out of my throne room. Get out of here. Don't you come before me. You're not worthy. Well, no, you're not worthy. By your own works, that Jesus has made you worthy. Jesus didn't die for you because you're worthy. You're worthy because he died for you. Now you come before the throne of God and say, God, I'm in need. Help me. And your heavenly Father loves you. His perfect love for you and your love for him cast out fear. All things work together for good to those that love God. So if you have a flat tire on the way home today, don't cuss and swear and say, well, God didn't cause this to happen, but he can work it together for my good. Sometimes bad things happen, and God, if you believe him for it, he'll work it together for your good right on the spot. And then I'm going to go back to Luke 6.45, and I'll conclude with this. Now, in conclusion, how do we make having the faith of God easy? Here's the bottom line. Job 22 says, you shall decree a thing. Jesus said, when you pray, believe you receive. Have you ever prayed for God to give you the faith of God? Now, I know that faith teachers, every one of them on television say, don't pray for faith. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Yes, but nowhere does the scripture forbid you to pray for faith. Whatever you desire. What do you desire? You desire to have the faith of God. To have all your needs met. To move them out if necessary. Whatever you desire, I desire the faith of God. When you pray, believe you receive it. You can say, Lord, give me the faith of God. Yes, ma'am. Actually, it is in Scripture. Because when the guy said uh, to Jesus, 
Jesus, you know, I believe help my unbelief. Yeah, he said help my unbelief. So it is hover. You yeah. can't do that. You can pray for faith. Even the disciples said increase our faith. Yeah. And yes. he did rebuke them. Yeah. Yeah. So they said, increase our faith. The man there in Mark 9 said, Lord, help thou my unbelief. And Jesus helped his unbelief by healing his child. It's not wrong to pray for faith. So here, have you ever thought about this? Let me give you two scriptures. Then I want to read this and we'll conclude. Mark 11, 24. Whatever you desire, I desire to have the faith of God. And I hope you do because Jesus commands you to have the faith of God. So you better desire that. Whatever you desire, when you pray, that's assuming you're going to pray. Believe you receive, and you got it. You'll have it. All right. Job 22, 28. Let me go back to that one last time. You shall decree a thing, and it will be established. If I ask God to give me something, and I believe I receive it, can I not decree I have it? If I'm asking God to supply my need, and I believe I receive, can I not decree I now have it? God changed Abram's name to Abraham. Every time Sarah said, hey, it's lunchtime, come in from outside, Abraham. She was calling him father of many nations. Every time he said, my name's Abraham, he said, I'm father of many nations. Think about that. Everywhere he went, he decreed, I'm father of many nations. That was his name. Have you ever thought about doing two things? Asking God to give you the faith of God to move around. Number two, Believe in you receive it to the point of you're willing to decree it. I did that last night. Lord, I I have the faith of God. God said, you do? Yeah. <laughs> I decree I've got the faith of God. Well, do you? Yeah, I just decreed it. And what I decree is established to me. Now, don't you come say, Keith, you ain't got that. I don't care what you say. God said I can have what I say. I say, I decree, I have the faith of God. If if Russia and America get into it, if China gets into it, if Europe gets into it, whatever, I'm going to survive because I have the faith of God. What about you? So you see, it's not that hard to have the faith of God. You're trying to work it up and work it up. Oh, I can just it like, you know, like, you ever seen an apple tree stand there grunting and grunting and say, what are you doing, tree? I'm trying to produce fruit. Uh-uh. The fruit just comes. You just decree it and believe you receive it. You got it. Okay, what's our question? Um, Randy Freeze. All right, how do we know that what we're asking is the will of God? Because the will of God is the Word of God. And you see that when you compare Mark 3.35 and Luke 8.21, God's Word is His will. And if His Word says it, then that's His will. And 1, Corinthians 5, uh, 1 John 5.14 says, here's the confidence that we have, that if we pray according to His will, if we pray according to His Word, then we have the answer. Verse 15 says, we know we have what we petitioned Him for. So how do we know we're praying according to His will? It's got to be in His Word. I don't see anything in here about Cadillacs. <laughs> I've read this whole book. I haven't seen the word Cadillac, but I have seen he'll supply my need. I have seen where it says, give us our daily bread. If that's his word, that's his will. Did you say the word Lexus in there? <laughs> I did find that, yeah. But the, that yeah, the Lexus need. is in there. <laughs> that was a need, so he, he supplied it through a generous benefactor. But sometimes he supplies our wants. Like my new job that I got a couple of years ago. I didn't need a new job, but I really wanted a new job. Maybe God said, I know she'll tithe to the ministry, so the, t the ministry needs you to get that job. Because that increased my time. <laughs> it increased your time. So, in conclusion, Luke, Luke 6, 45 says, If you will speak out of the abundance of your heart, how do you get it in your heart? Read this book. Read it and read it and read it and read it. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. And you can even start quoting the word as you're walking down the sidewalk. When you're in the grocery store. When you're driving down the road. Thank you, God. All my needs are supplied. And you said if I believed I received, I'd have it. And I've decreed this. I've got it. And before you get to your destination, you've built your faith up. Faith comes by hearing and hearing. And you hear it over and over. And after a while, you will begin to believe it. It's easy. I decree I have the faith of God. I may not look like it, but I believe it. So if I speak out of the abundance of my heart, whatever I say, if I really believe in my heart I'm going to die in six months because the doctor said so, you better get ready to die. But if I believe in my heart God's healing me, get ready to be healed. Amen? Any questions?
said you were saving something for last. Did you read it? That was, uh, I think, uh, no, I, yeah, I did. I, numbers 23, 19, I saved that and I gave it officially. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. What's the question? Okay, so Ashley's prayer request. And Randy Freeze, he's one of our graduates from Canada. He got his bachelor's associate's bachelor's on online campus. And he helps me a lot with tech support and stuff that I don't know how to do. And he posted this in the chat asking the online people for a prayer request that you got. I wanted to give it to you guys too since you're not seeing the chat. And Randy said, please keep me in your prayers. I've been fighting COVID for the past week. And they thought I had the measles because of a rash that's driving me crazy. Now they are calling it a COVID rash because my COVID test came back positive. And my COVID symptoms are getting better, but the rash is driving me crazy and it has spread all over my body. Ooh, yeah. You sure that's not shingles? I don't know. It sounds like shingles. It sounds like shingles. That sounds like shingles. Because but, if he had the measles when he was young, that sounds like shingles. And if it's burning yeah. and if it's yeah. really sore. Randy's a lot younger than me, so he probably had the shingles vaccine, the shingles vaccine when he was a kid. So he may not have even had shingles when he was a yeah. kid. But one other, speaking of COVID, and I just happened to think about it, this little girl, that, she's not a little girl, she's a grown woman, she, she's a teacher. She, when I used to go to a Sunday church, I called preschool Sunday school, and she, I had her in Sunday school, she was three. She's 32 weeks pregnant and just tested COVID positive. And this has been a hard pregnancy already. So if y'all will remember her in your prayers. Do it now. Her name's Anna. I was getting ready to. Yeah. If I can remember all of this. Both of these. Yeah. Who was the other guy? Randy. 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 When you go to your knees today on, on God's holy Sabbath and you pray, but pray based on what I'm getting ready to pray now that you're in agreement. Father in heaven, you are our healer through Jesus Christ. And we ask you in Jesus' name, heal Randy, heal this, heal him of this COVID, the, the rash, whatever is causing it. We curse that rash. We curse the cause of that rash. And we command it to die in Jesus' name. It's gone. It's dead. And you decree it and believe it. Amen. The girl that's... Uh, Her name is Anna. Anna. Anna, yeah. Let's pray for Anna. Father, she's 32 weeks pregnant. You know the situation. She's tested COVID positive. We ask you now to heal her body of this COVID disease and let her baby be born nat the way it's supposed to be born, to be born normally and with no problems. And we curse that COVID command it to leave her body. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, you believe that. Yeah. I'm sorry I held you a little bit over time again today. Sometimes I do that. Are there any other questions or comments? Oh, it's good to see everybody here today. Welcome to all, all of our online audience. How many people do we have watching today? Um, there's 15 people watching on Facebook and nine watching on YouTube. Oh, that's great. So our audience is growing. Tell other people about our, our <laughs> services. Tell them to be watching too and invite them to watch. They might learn something that could even save their life. You're and dismissed. You know, and if you know people that, if you're on Facebook, but you know people that don't have a Facebook, we're live on YouTube on our YouTube channel every week. Yeah, we're live on YouTube every week too. God bless you all. See y'all next week.